Yeah, I'll talk about something called uh, conformal prediction today. It's a one universal way to uh, quantify predictive uncertainty uh, for machine learning models in Julia. Uh, here's the agenda. Um, I think you want to probably focus on the links here, so there will be a short demo in, in Pluto. Uh, I recommend you to just download the notebook if you want to follow along and run it locally using this uh, link, tiny dot, uh, tinyul.com slash cpjcon2023. If you feel particularly daring this morning, you can try Binder, but in my experience, especially with this Wi-Fi, it doesn't work so well. Um, and if you just want to follow along the slides, you can use this alternative link down there. So what is conformal prediction? Uh, it involves uh, turning heuristic notions of predictive uncertainty into rigorous ones, and I'll go on to explain this in some more detail. Um, but why I'm motivated to work on this, or what originally brought me to this, is this idea that if we want to build trustworthy AI systems, then sort of as a minimum requirement for these systems uh, in the context of machine learning, where prediction is kind of still the holy grail, I want to at least know how certain or uncertain the model is about its predictions. And I won't go into this too much, but one of the simplest versions of conformal prediction essentially relies on data splitting. So if we are in the context of uh, deep learning, for example, we would uh, split our data into a proper training set, uh, and then a calibration set, and then probably also a validation set and a test set. So a lot of splitting, um, but it, it does help us to, to quantify predictive uncertainty. And essentially, uh, what, what the, the term calibration set already implies is that we will use part of the data to understand how uncertain uh, my model is locally about certain predictions, and then we use that information at the test phase to generate uh, something called prediction sets in this context. Uh, if you go to the slides, there's a couple of uh, blog posts um, that I host on various uh, forums uh, that you can use to, to yeah, dive a bit deeper. I want to just illustrate this uh, process visually here for you. So we have in the top left just the uh, predicted softmax output for the target class uh, one in this case. Then on the top right, we have uh, calibration scores. Uh, in, in the context of classification, a standard go-to is just one minus the uh, softmax output uh, of the true class. What we then do, and again, this is just the simplest form of conformal prediction, is we we take um, the one minus alpha quantile. Uh, one minus alpha here is just the user-specified coverage rate. So it is the uh, probability that you want to specify um, that the test label is included in the prediction set at test time. And this holds provably, um, but I won't do any proofs. <laughs> uh, and what you can see on the bottom right is the resulting uh, prediction set for the test point that is illustrated as this uh, little yellow star in the top left chart. Uh, and you can see already this idea of prediction sets as opposed to just one softmax output for the top, uh, top one label. Um, and in particular, in cases where the uh, test point is perhaps between two classes near the decision boundary, you will realize that the prediction set is typically larger. So in, in some cases here we have two labels, in some cases where the classifier is quite certain, we just have one label included. So the package, um, just uh, yeah, a few high level points, it's built on top of MLJ, so basically any supervised machine learning model that you can find in MLJ is compatible with this package, uh, including uh, deep learning models uh, that are built in Flux, through MLJ Flux. And we have, at this point, implemented many state-of-the-art uh, approaches to conformal prediction uh, for regression classification and also time series modeling. So I'll start off with a couple of uh, applications and examples. By show of hands, anyone who attended the symbolic regression talk this week Quite a few people, that's great. Um, so I attended that talk as well. I thought it was very interesting. And since Miles uh, mentioned that the package is also interfaced to MLJ, I thought 
let me try this out. And so I put together this slide uh, to, to illustrate how easy it is really to, to use conformal prediction. Um, so we have our standard MLJ workflows here. So that line four to, five, four to eight is um, Miles Kramer's package uh, for symbolic regression. So we train a symbolic regression model here on some synthetic data. We'll see it works remarkably well. Uh, to conformalize that model, we have to do this. So essentially, one line of code if we don't account for the uh, using conformal prediction part. And then we continue on with our standard MLJ workflows. And this is what we get. So instead of just having uh, point predictions, we get a prediction interval uh, at the, which, which depending on the coverage rate that we determined um, varies in, in width. And we'll see more examples now in the uh, demo. Just another quick example. Um, I don't know if you heard about LLMs, uh, kind of a bus term right now. Uh, we, uh, uh, in, during ING experiment, experiment week, uh, which was a month ago, we, we tried to apply conformal prediction uh, in the context of something called intent recognition. So here you have a chatbot um, that essentially tries to understand uh, what, what kind of intent users have. So user might be asking, my credit card is not working, and then you want to be able to help them as efficiently as possible with that problem. Um, so we used a pre-trained model uh, on some, some banking-related data, um, and we, we built a small uh, chatbot that uses conformal prediction on top of that to, to generate uh, intent sets that incorporate predictive uncertainty. So if the initial prompt is very ambiguous, these, these uh, intent sets will be larger, uh, and if the uh, prompt is very clear, the intent set will be quite small. We have a paper currently under review um, where we show that uh, this outperforms uh, many existing approaches. And again, there's also links to uh, further material. I'll probably skip over this, but it also works with uh, image classifiers. Um, so here we have an image of a seven a handwritten uh, MNIST image, which could also maybe be a two, but it's probably a seven. Uh, the conformal prediction set addresses this predictive uncertainty. So it tells you, yes, seven is the most likely answer, but there's also a small probability that it's two or four. And there's, this, there's certain digits that you typically uh, see uh, come up together in prediction sets because they're similar. And finally here, a quick um, shout out to Mochtaba Famanba, a colleague at ING who recently implemented uh, conformal prediction to time series modeling. Uh, I won't go into details here, but uh, feel free to ask me after the session. Now moving on to the interactive session. So I want to use this mostly to, to illustrate the workflows a bit more, and this time in the context of regression. So first here, we, we bring the chart that we saw before to life, uh, and just see what happens if we uh, change the coverage rate or move across the domain. So let's see uh, what happens if I move over. So now we're in a, the, the yellow uh, star is now in a region um, where things look pretty certain, like we're close to, uh, to this orange, orange class. And in fact, our model pretty confidently predicts class one in this case. And uh, this is the only class that is included in the prediction set. So we have a, a single value in the prediction set, which again expresses that in this case, predictive uncertainty is very low. And you can play around with this in your, in your own time a little more if you want. Um, you can change the coverage rate. In this case, if I go very high, um, then we will start including also other possible labels in the, in the uh, prediction set because a very high coverage set essentially implies that if we want 100% coverage, or the, the best thing we can do is just to include every label. Now, if you come from a domain where regression is more common, um, it's actually the case for myself, then this next part of the uh, demo might be easier for you to follow. So here I just uh, simulate some synthetic data. Uh, you can use this notebook to uh, kind of define the functional form uh, that you like. So we can also 
use cosine here or whatever function you want. Uh, and then from this uh, ground truth data generating process, I generate noisy observations. You can play here again with a uh, domain. You can play with the number of observations. Let's keep it at this for now. Then we'll start off with, uh, and if you're familiar with MLJ, this will be uh, something that you you find quite easy to understand. Um, we'll start with standard uh, machine learning workflows using MLJ. So we just partition our data into a train and test set. We then wrap our model in data. So this is uh, machines in, in MLJ. And then we finally uh, fit this machine uh, to the data, in this case, the, the training rows. And what we get is, uh, in this case, fairly uh, accurate uh, point predictions. So that's the, the orange line here. But of course, in many contexts, a point prediction is not enough. Uh, I have a background in economics, for example, and if, uh, used to work at the Bank of England. If the Bank of England was to uh, publish inflation forecasts uh, that only include a point estimate, that's, that's not enough. We want to have some sense of uh, the predictive uncertainty. So inflation could be 2.5% in the next quarter. It could be 2% at the lower bottom. So once again, simple, simple API call. We just conformalize the model here using the standard uh, split conformal method. We follow MLJ workflows again. And here's our resulting predictive interval. And we can play around with the uh, coverage rate here. Again, you see that, of course, if I increase the coverage rate, the, the interval width um, will widen. So this is the equivalent to the prediction set in, in classification, increasing in size. If we go very low, then, yeah, sure, we have a more precise forecast, but we, we uh, commit the risk of, of uh, yeah, committing more errors. Um, yeah, we, I really try to, to maximize the compatibility with MLJ. So we can also use standard evaluation workflows. Um, and there's links here in, the, in, the, uh, in this notebook to the tutorial uh, in the MLJ documentation. So here we actually test, uh, in this case on a simple holdout set, the empirical coverage. So we specify beforehand, OK, I want to have 50% coverage. Uh, this holds in expectation. Um, up to sort of a, yeah, a concentration inequality, um, but it doesn't, it won't sort of exactly hold. We won't uh, always get exactly 50% coverage. And in this case, here we now have 46% uh, uh, coverage instead of 50%. Uh, n that's pretty far away of, of the 50% the that we wanted, but it has to do with the fact that we're dealing with a fairly small data set here. Um, we can, for example, increase this. Where was it? Up here. Then we should get closer to what we're asking for. Yeah, so now we're pretty close to the, to the 50%, right? We're still slightly below, but there you go. Um, there are, as I promised earlier, uh, many other ways to, uh, to approach conform prediction. I won't go into many details here, but you can play around with any of these approaches. Essentially, what they try to address is different sort of desirable properties of these uh, prediction intervals. You can imagine that one desirable property is that the prediction interval is adaptive. So it's wide in regions where predictive uncertainty is actually high and much narrower in regions where predictive uncertainty is low. And we have some standard plotting methods that uh, make this easy to, to understand and visualize. Um, so there are certain uh, methods in conformal prediction that, that just produce standard, uh, sorry, uh, constant intervals. Um, those are obviously not adaptive. But then, for example, jackknife uh, min max here produces uh, interval widths of le uh, varying lengths. And, and that's something we want to observe. So this was a very quick tour of the package. Now I want to finish that tour off with a quick uh, yeah, caveat, pointer to, some of, to, to one of the uh, limitations of conformal predictions. Uh, it does rest on the notion of exchangeability. So that's uh, broadly uh, similar to, to the IID assumption that some of you may have heard of in, in machine learning statistics. So what happens if I move out of domain here? And to, to illustrate this, I use this chart here. The whole thing kind of 
doesn't perform so well anymore. <laughs> um, so when I first observe, observed this and, and, and visualized this, I was a bit disappointed and uh, uh, opened a, a discussion on my own repo, uh, kind of uh, tagging uh, people who are working on this field, pushing this field, uh, which I'm not one of those people, by the way. Um, but I compared this to uh, the same graph, uh, the same chart or same result, uh, but apply using, using a plus redox, an another package um, that I presented last year, actually, um, which is a very simple way to do Bayesian deep learning. Uh, here, this epistemic uncertainty is covered uh, much in a much better way, right? The interval, the prediction interval just explodes far away from the training data, which is something that you would typically observe in, the, in a Bayesian context. Um, and the answer I got was, was very nice uh, from, from uh, Anastasios Angelopoulos. Um, that this, this shouldn't be disappointing news because we can just use our Bayesian uh, predictions, our predictive uh, posterior, as a, uh, as a heuristic. So earlier I was saying, let's just use one minus uh, softmax. If we have a better heuristic notion of predictive uncertainty, let's just use that. Um, and that's actually one of the things that I'm uh, working on. We're not quite there, but we have uh, Laplace Redux now interface to MLJ flux, um, which should then also make uh, that package compatible with, uh, with conformal prediction. So in this case, um, and this is actually, uh, they elaborate on this in, in this really great tutorial on conformal prediction, uh, what you end up conformalizing is not one minus the softmax output, but the predictive density. So you're, you're kind of shrinking the, the prediction set based on the predictive posterior. And then this is kind of summarizing my PhD in one slide. <laughs> so I'm actually working on something uh, not totally unrelated, but, but I'm working on something called counterfactual explanations, which is a way to uh, try and explain um, these uh, sometimes very uh, instable neural networks, try and understand how they behave, how they make their decisions. Um, and one, it turns out that one thing that is very useful in this context is, a, is an understanding of the predictive uncertainty of models. Um, basically, counterfactual search involves uh, changes in the, in the input space. So we, we tweak the inputs, we move to a counterfactual state that flips the label in some, some targeted uh, way. Um, and then we can read off the, the necessary changes or these feature perturbations as an explanation for how the class in, the, in, the classifier, in the classifier's view, uh, an input needs to change for the prediction to change. But if we just um, do that in the, in the kind of baseline way, just gradient descent in the feature space, we end up sometimes with these uh, cases where we move across the decision boundary, but then we're, then we're done. So we're at the decision boundary, which is kind of the region of, of maximal predictive uncertainty. And uh, this, this counterfactual here, I mean, it's, it does the job. It's a valid explanation, but it looks nothing like the, uh, the, the original samples in the, in the training population. Um, yeah, and it turns out you can use predictive uncertainty to, to ensure that we move to a counterfactual state that is characterized by low predictive uncertainty. Um, and we thought, okay, let's, let's try and use conformal predictions in this context. And the reason was that conformal prediction is so universally uh, applicable to, to all kinds of machine learning models. The problem was that what you, what you get from conformal prediction uh, as your sort of uncertainty metric, metric is, is a set size, which is a discrete, non-smooth function. So in the context of uh, gradient-based uh, counterfactual search, you can't really work with that. Uh, but it turns out that some other very smart people from uh, Google, Google DeepMind, I think they're called now, um, have worked on uh, differentiability in the context of conformal training. So slightly different motivation here, but essentially they propose smooth versions of the uh, set size, set size loss, um, also a smooth uh, classification loss. And they use that to, to train models to generate efficient, adaptive conformal predictions. And we've just taken this in the context of counterfactual explanations for our own purposes in some work that is currently under review. Uh, the full kind of conformal training implementation is uh, still a, working, a work in process. Um, and everywhere in the slides where there is uh, room for contributions, I, I added some pointers. 
And finally, uh, I think we actually have quite a bit of time for, for questions. I rushed through this, so if we, we have 10 minutes now, if there was anything unclear, I can go back to, to certain points in the slides. Um, here's a couple of pointers. Uh, so since the beginning of my PhD, I've been yeah, working on a, on a couple of packages that all broadly fall under this umbrella of uh, trustworthy AI, responsible AI, whatever you want to call it. And I've started uh, collecting them in, in a GitHub organization. Um, it's a very loosely defined home of trustworthy AI. So if you have anything that you think fits into this framework, feel free to contribute. As I said, I'm still very new to Julia myself, so always very open to contributions. But now time for questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I made the question, yeah, a little bit related to the comparison you gave to the Bayesian. Like, uh, what does conformal prediction actually do? So how how is this interval um, computed? Especially if you think for some, for example, like if we get a full coverage, I guess that some sampling is going on. So you always are bounded by the number of samples. So you never really know what the hundred percent really is. Like, can you say a little bit around this? What's actually the computation which leads to the um, normalization? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's probably one of the parts I I did rush a bit too much in the end. Um, so let me go back to this slide that we had here, uh, and maybe I'll just take this bit by bit now. So. In, again, this is the, the most trivial, but I think the most easy to understand approach to conformal prediction, which relies on, on, on this calibration data set, data splitting. And what ends up happening is you just you fit your, your model, uh, whatever kind of predictive model, on your training data. And then you, lose, you use the, the trained model on the calibration data set to compute something called uh, non-conformity scores. So in the simplest case, that's just in, in, the, in the classification setting, one minus the, the softmax output of the true class. And then you just compute the whatever uh, user-specified uh, quantile uh, of, of that population, of that emp empirical distribution of non-conformity scores. And you use that quantile value to eventually define your, your prediction set. You're asking about 100% uh, coverage. Uh, in my mind, the only way to truly achieve 100% coverage is to just always include all labels. But you can get to, like the proof holds, probably also to, to 100%, I'm not so sure, but something very close to 100%. Do we have any other question? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could compare, because when I looked at the plots, it looked to me a lot like Gaussian processes. So if you could compare um, the differences between your approach and the general GP's uh, framework. Do you mean the, the plot on the, the GitHub issue that I opened, or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one second. You mean this one, I guess, right? Yeah, generally, that you have Gaussian blob, uh, processes in order to estimate the uncertainty, right. given yeah. the data set. And how is your um, approach different in what uh, cases? So, so here I'm just using a, a Bayesian neural network, which is, I guess, comes, comes close in, in spirit to Gaussian process, but I'm not super familiar with GPs. Um, so, so I'm, yeah, I'm not, so I guess the, the difference between Gaussian processes and, and, and this approach is that um, you don't really, in this context, make any assumptions about the distribution of the data and also not on, on the model itself. So you can, it's purely based on the, uh, on the data itself. So you just can apply it to, to any machine learning model. 
Okay, yeah, so it's about this uh, split, splitting of the data that you said about yeah. the previous question. Yeah. Okay, I see. And, and that splitting approach is, is the simplest approach, as far as I'm aware. Um, other approaches, typically, that don't rely on data splitting, they just sift through your training data set repeatedly, which means that there's a little bit more of a tax on, on, on training because you have to retrain your model more. Okay, often. but in no way you make any assumptions about the underlying modeling uh, no. Distribution something. Okay, no. that's and that's what, to me, makes this approach very appealing. So yeah, the only yeah, assumption so. that you really make is this assumption of exchange exchangeability, which, which I try to illustrate with this example here, that that's perhaps a stronger assumption than, than some people like to, okay, to present. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you a lot. We have another question here. Oh, okay. It was the same question. So... Does anybody else have another question? Uh, so using this method, what fraction of the data do you need to split off and then later analyze to get the good result? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's basically not so much about the fraction, but you need at least a thousand calibration points for split conformal prediction to get to get close to a nice concentration inequality. Um, in this paper that I've linked uh, somewhere in the slides, uh, which I really recommend, by the way, uh, they show, they have some charts here where they show um, how the, the expected error um, of the empirical coverage rate depends on the calibration set size, but this is in absolute terms. You can see here that pretty quickly for N1000, um, the, the error gets pretty small very quickly. Uh, so this is on the x-axis, you have the user-specified coverage here, 90%. And then for different choices of N, which is the calibration set size, you have the distribution of the uh, empirical errors, the empirical deviation of that specified coverage rate. Mm, awesome, thanks. Do you know how that scales? So, for example, if I'm doing classification, do you know how that scales uh, based on number of classes? Yeah, so that's also a good question. <laughs> so, um, I've been talking about this, mostly thinking about binary classification. Um, you, if you want class conditional coverage, so that this coverage actually holds for every class, Essentially, what you have to do is to run the calibration step by class. But it, while this obviously adds a computational burden, there are some approaches now coming out um, that essentially involve uh, clustering as a pre-processing step to reduce the number of classes. Um, the, the computational burden is still not very high because all you essentially need to do, even in the context of deep learning uh, for split conformal prediction, is to, to, you just run a forward pass, right? You're just computing predictions and then conformity scores based on that. So that there's not really much retraining and yeah, it's really not that, that bad in my experience. Even with the LLM, it, it worked. All right, let's take our speaker again.